Welcome to video 5.1, where we are going to be talking about programmatic data access in HBase. Now we're going to start by showing how to write a JRuby program that's going to be able to enter data into HBase, and then another JRuby program that's going to be able to read data back out of HBase, and then finally we'll close this video by importing a larger amount of data using a CSV file. Now, as we mentioned in an earlier video, if we're using the put command at the HBase shell, we're only able to insert one value at a time. And no matter how rapidly we insert values, all of the values are going to have a different timestamp associated with them in their metadata. So the question arises, well, what if we want to have multiple values entered into our database as kind of one continuous object and all have the same timestamp, or even if we just want to be able to insert data a little bit more efficiently than having a whole bunch of individual put commands. Well, we can write a small program using JRuby in order to do this. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here is a sample JRuby program that we can use to write data into HBase. JRuby is just a Java-based implementation of Ruby, and, and this code looks a lot like uh, what you would typically see in either a Java application or a Ruby application. Now let's just walk through a couple of things and I'll, I'll point some things out. Um, if you're familiar with programming at all, uh, one thing you may be aware is that most programming languages have kind of a limited set of functionality that they can natively do, but we can extend that by importing packages and libraries that allow us to uh, do additional things. So in this case, we're importing two packages from org.apache.hadoop.hbase.client, the first of which allows us to interact with HBase tables, and the second of which allows us to do a put command into HBase. Okay, we have some additional setup of our uh, program here. And then this line here is creating a table object, which is going to refer to our customer's table. Then the next line is creating a row object with a uh, value of 200. And then these next couple of lines here are inserting data into this row object. Okay, so we're inserting uh, for the details column family and name qualifier a value of Nancy. And for the details column family and the phone qualifier, this value, and then for address, this value. And then this final line here is using the put method to write the, this object into the table. Okay, so instead of doing a bunch of individual put, put commands, which are all going to get their own timestamp, what we're doing here is creating one object that is going to be put into our HBase table just one time. And so all of our values are going to have the same timestamp. Now, in order to execute this Ruby script, we just, uh, from our Linux command prompt, not from inside HBase shell, but from our Linux command prompt, we're going to say HBase shell and then the name of the Ruby program. Uh, in this case, we're going to call it multi.rb. Okay, and so this is going to tell the shell to execute this Ruby program. And let's go ahead and flip over to HBase and see what this looks like. So here I'm just at my uh, Linux command prompt. I run the uh, ls command, which lists the content of your current directory. Uh, in this case, I have the three Ruby programs that we're going to be using in this video. And what we're interested in right now is multi.rb. And if we want to edit this, we can use the nano text editor. That's uh, one of the more user friendly uh, text editors. And this is just the same exact thing uh, that we have in our PowerPoint slides. Now, one thing that uh, I will point out is if we go into our HBase shell, we've already created the customers table. It's just the same exact customers table from uh, the previous set of videos. So we have customers, I can say scan customers, and you see we have these three customers with row keys 101, 102, and 103, and the same data that we used in the previous videos. So I'm going to exit out of HBase, and then type HBase shell multi.rb, 
And this is going to execute that multi.rb Ruby program. And it takes the client just a moment to start up. It runs the script. Now we're in the HBase shell. And if I were to say scan customers again, you can see that we have some new values here for this customer with a row key of 200. And here's the uh, uh, value for name, for address, for phone. And one thing I'll point out is that all three of these values have the exact same timestamp ending with 9646, right? So the JRuby program just created an object and that object was written to the HBase database instead of each one of these values being written individually, which is what we see with all of these uh, very different timestamps for the other values. So that's all well and good and kind of useful, but it's very limiting that we've hard coded these values into the Ruby program, because if we want to insert different values, we would have to open up the, the Ruby program and change the values and close it and run it again. So what I present to you here is a slightly modified version of this program, which is going to allow us to pass in values at the command line. So we're starting off in exactly the same way, but then we have a couple of lines here that are going to take arguments that are passed in at the command line and store those the values of those arguments as the name of the table, as the row key for the customer that we're going to be entering data for, and for the column family that we're going to be entering data for. And then we're going to loop through as many column family qualifiers and values as we've passed in at the command line. Okay, so this application takes data in the format of, well, we start off the same way, HBase shell, and then the name of the Ruby program that we want to execute. But then argument zero is the table name, argument one is the row key, argument two is the column family, and then everything beyond that is going to be a column family qualifier or a value. Okay, so basically what happens is argument zero gets stored as the table name, argument one as the row key, argument two as the column family, and then those get passed down to this part of the program. So when we create our table object, like we uh, did in the other program, it's creating the table object for whatever table we passed in here at the command line. Okay, and then when it creates the row, it creates the row with a row key of whatever we passed in at the command line. And then when it starts to add to the row, it uses whatever column family we passed in at the command line. Okay, and then we have a loop here, which is going to execute until it is executed more times than whatever the number of column fam or number of column family qualifiers we passed in at the command line is. Okay, it's a little bit tricky, but if you've done some programming before, uh, this hopefully will make sense. So right here, we're setting a value to this limit attribute, which is going to be however many arguments we have passed in. Okay, and in this case, it's going to be seven. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Computers start counting at 0, but we have 7 arguments that we passed in here. So our loop is going to continue executing until the value of n is above or greater than or equal to 7. Okay, so we're starting with the value of 3 for n because we've already used uh, arguments 0, 1, and 2. So argument 3 is going to be our first column family qualifier, and then argument 3 plus 1, or 4, is going to be the first value. So we're adding to this row this column family qualifier and this value, and then we're going to add 2 to n. So now the value of n is going to be 5, is 5 greater than or equal to 7? Well, no is the answer to that. So we're going to get the next column family qualifier and value, uh, 5 and 6. Then we're going to add 2 to n, which is going to give it a value of 7, which is greater than or equal to the limit, 7. And so it's going to drop out of the loop. Okay, And it'll just keep doing that until we get above the limit. So we might execute something like this. 
uh, HBase shell data input customers 201 details, which is the uh, column family name John Smith, and then phone 555-123-1234. And let's just uh, jump right over to HBase and we'll take a look at, uh, at how this goes. So uh, I have my uh, data input Ruby file and this is exactly what we have in the uh, PowerPoint slides over here. So I'm gonna say HBase shell data input dot RB. We are going to input into our customers table and we're in we're entering customer 201 and we're going to be specifying uh, values for our details column family name john smith phone uh five five and we don't need quotes around that five 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 we'll do it like that and so whenever we have a value that has a space in it that we're interacting with at the command line, we can wrap that in quotation marks so that it's treated as one uh, single value. But when we run this, give it just a moment. And uh, kick this out of HBase shell, but that's okay. We'll go back in there and take a look. We can now scan customers and you see that this data we passed in at the command line got entered into the table. And of course it has the same timestamp because what the script was or what the Ruby application was doing was creating an object and inserting that object all at once. Now, one thing I have to point out to you is that this is not a very good program I have written here. Okay, it's uh, not very intuitive. It's kind of a weird format that we've got to specify things in just the right order. Uh, it's not very flexible because I didn't build it such that we could uh, pass in qualifiers for multiple column families, but hopefully this kind of gives you a little bit of an idea about how programs can interact with HBase. And you could modify this Ruby program in a thousand different ways to make it work a little bit better uh, with a little bit more flexibility uh, to include error checking, right? There's a lot of different stuff you could do, but hopefully this just kind of gives you an idea of how applications can interact with HBase. So of course, in addition to writing data, it would also be nice to be able to programmatically read data back out of HBase. So here is a similar JRuby program, which is going to allow us to read data. Uh, one thing I'll point out is that we are importing some slightly different packages. Instead of put, we want get and result. And there's no reason you couldn't have a program that both reads and writes to uh, your HBase database. And you would just include all of the packages you need. Um, but we have a lot of the same structure here. We're going to pass into this program the uh, table, the row key, the column family, and the qualifier that we are interested in. And the way this program is structured, we're only going to be reading one value out at a time. Okay, it's going to create an object for your table. Uh, it's going to create an object to retrieve the row that we're interested in, and then it's going to return the data value of that row. So again, let's uh, go over to our HBase server and see what this looks like. Okay, so we're gonna exit out of the HBase shell because we need to execute this script from the uh, command line. Uh, again, if we wanted to take a look at what is in the program, we can use the uh, nano text editor. So nano get data. This is just exactly what is in the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so now we want to execute this using the HBase client. So we'll say HBase shell uh, get data dot RB. And then we have to pass these arguments in the first one being the name of the table, which is customers. And let's get our uh, data for customer 200. And we want from the details column family, the value of the column family qualifier name. So when we run this, the client takes just a moment to get started. And then we see the name for 
the customer with a row key of 200 is Nancy, right? Or we could do a customer 201 and we get back a value of John Smith, there we go, right? So now we're able to programmatically read the data back out of HBase. Now again, this is not a perfect application. There is a quite a bit of uh, other stuff you could do to make this more useful, but hopefully it gives you an idea of how you can programmatically interact with HBase. The final topic we are going to cover in this video is how to import data from a CSV file. And there are quite a few steps that we have to go through here to get our data and get it to the server and then get it into the Hadoop environment and then uh, be able to import it. So let's take a look at what all we have to do. Now, first of all, we have to make sure our table exists in HBase. Okay, so let's go ahead and flip over to HBase and take a look at that. So I'm gonna go into the HBase shell and we're going to be importing our US counties data that we've used in some previous examples into our HBase server here. So at this point, we have only the customers table, but I'm gonna run the statement to create a, uh, a table for counties. And uh, as I mentioned, Previously, since we're all sharing the same HBase environment, I'm going to put my initials MG in front of it. So if you're following along, uh, you don't accidentally uh, create, try to create the same table I already have. And I would ask that you do the same, put your, uh, like your Blackboard login in front of any tables you create. So I'm creating a table called MG Counties with the column families of summary, ethnicity, financial, work, transportation, and work sector. And these are just column families that I made up based on uh, kind of the categories of data that I saw in the uh, in the data set. So when I do this, now we have a table called MG counties. And of course, if I scan MG counties, there is nothing in there just yet. Okay, so I've created my table, I'm going to be done in HBase for uh, for just a minute. But we know that that's there. Okay, now we have to work with our source data file, uh, which in this case is a CSV file that I have on my computer and I've just conveniently stored it in C colon backslash data. Um, this is a file that we're going to be using for another example in a few minutes, but here is the H or the uh, MG US counties formatted for HBase CSV file. If I open this up, this data hopefully looks uh, kind of familiar. It's just all of our states, all of our counties, and then all of the uh, values associated with them. And one thing I need to point out is that the way the import utility works, it does not want a header. So I, I've stripped off the header uh, that describes what all of the attributes are. And you'll see in just a minute how we get that uh, metadata about our data uh, back in there. Next, we need to copy this CSV file up to our HBase server. And uh, there are a number of ways we can do this, but I'm going to suggest the utility PSFTP, which is part of the PuTTY suite of tools that you probably already have on your computer, is going to be one of the easier ways that we can do this. So this is a secure copy utility. There's a number of others that you could use, but we're gonna use PSFTP here. Uh, when we launch it, in order to connect to our HBase server, we're gonna say open and then the DNS name of the HBase server. It's gonna ask for a username and password. So we're going to provide that. And now we are connected to the HBase server. And I'm gonna say put C colon backslash and then the name of the file, which is mg us counties underscore hbase.csv. When I do this, it actually, oh, put, I left out my directory here, data backslash mg us counties. And so this actually just copied this CSV file over the internet to my hbase server. So if we go back over to hbase now and I do an ls, we can see that we have 
this CSV file. This is what was just copied from my desktop computer that I'm recording these videos on to the HBase server that is up in the AWS cloud. Okay, so now that this file is here, the next thing we have to do is copy it into the Hadoop environment where HBase can access it. It needs to be copied over to our HDFS or Hadoop distributed file system in order to uh, allow the import to happen. So we're gonna use this command Hadoop FS, copy from local, and then the name of the file and then the location within HDFS that we're copying to, which in this case is a temp directory, okay? So I'm gonna copy and paste this command, Hadoop FS, copy from local, this is the local file and this is the destination in Hadoop FS that we are copying to. And this should be a fairly fast operation and it is. Now, one kind of neat thing that I will point out is if we go over to our Hadoop uh, HDFS management console, uh, which is at the address of our cluster, uh, colon 50070, and we go to this utilities uh, tab and look at browse the file system, we can see that we have a temp directory. This is the directory we just copied that file into. And here is our MG US counties underscore hbase.csv file. Okay, so this is actually representing the file being stored in HDFS. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in the next video. So we have one copy of the file on our local computer, one copy on the, uh, the, on the master server in our HBase cluster. And then now we've copied the same file over into the HDFS data store. Now, the next thing we need to do once the file is in HDFS and is going to be able to be accessed by HBase is to run the import command. Okay, and so this is a utility called import TSV and I've, I've made different colors, all the individual uh, aspects of it here so we can kind of walk through it step by step, but we're going to run HBase and we're going to tell HBase, we don't want to run HBase shell this time. We want to run the HBase uh, import TSV utility, uh, which we refer to as org.apache.hadoop.hbase.mapreduce.importtsv. And what this utility is going to do is create a MapReduce job that is going to go through this entire CSV file and parse it and write it into HBase. So after we tell it the utility we want to run, we tell it that the separator is going to be a comma because this is a comma separated file. And then we have to specify what, the, what all of the columns are. So a column family and a column family qualifier for each value that we're passing in, okay? And we have to start with hbase underscore row underscore key. So this is going to be our unique identifier for every row and then column family, colon, qualifier, column family, colon, qualifier, and so on until we've specified a column family qualifier for every value that is in this uh, CSV file. Finally, we tell it what table we're passing these uh, values into, and then the location of the source data in our HDFS data store, which in this case is in temp US counties underscore hbase.csv. Okay, so the actual command I'm going to be running is this, which is long and gnarly looking because we have so many column family qualifiers that we are passing in. Okay, so now I'm going to go back over to the HBase server and note that I am just at the Linux command prompt. I'm not in HBase shell right now. I'm gonna paste this big, long, gnarly command and so a MapReduce job has been created that is parsing the CSV file and entering the data into HBase. This is gonna take just a moment to run. And now that it's done, I can go into HBase shell. And we see that I have my MG underscore US counties table here. If I say scan MG US counties, we get 
all of these counties that we have been working with. And of course, we could uh, do something. We could say something instead of scan, like get mg us counties and specify a particular county we're interested in. Like I happen to know 48201 is Harris County, Texas. So this is just one of many ways we can get data into HBase. If you just Google uh, HBase data import, there are a lot of different approaches, but uh, this is one way that would be uh, commonly used to get data into HBase and might come in useful. So that's it for this video. And in the next video, we're going to be importing even more data into HBase and using that to demonstrate some of the HBase architecture features. See you there.